When you're looking at perfection, you're also looking at the fear of failure. And so I felt as though I, I, I was, I was failing. So it was all or nothing. It's no, it's no different than any disease that, you know, people have, whether you're an alcoholic, you, you go over the top, you take one, one or two, too many drinks, and now you've done it. I was the same way. I, I, and it's hard for people to understand, go out and exercise because it makes you feel better. I get it. Yeah. That is, I get it. I get it to the thousandth degree and I have a steadfast rule. Go 20 minutes and do something, but do 20 minutes a day because you're going to get this morphine like effect and it will satiate you. But back then it was all or nothing. And so the, the nothing part of it was, okay, I won't do it today. And it was a self-inflicted punishment that could carry on for days. And so I had a lot of those currents throughout the years that I won the Ironman, people didn't know about them because what they'd see is Dave Scott is amazing on Ironman day. He can do it. That's Dave Scott, triathlon legend and six-time winner of Ironman Hawaii. And this is the Oxygenatic Triathlon Podcast. And welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Electrolytes and different strengths that match how you sweat. You can get 15% off your first order with the code OxygenAddict15. And we're also brought to you by Thriver.co, the simple finger prick blood test you can do at home to track hormone, vitamin and mineral levels in your body. 10% off all subscriptions with the code OxygenAddict10. All right, everybody. Hope you're all good. Welcome to the show. I've got a cracker lined up for you today. We've got some news and results. We've got some chat about Outlaw X coming up, but we have also got an interview with the one and only six-time winner of Ironman Hawaii, Mr. Dave Scott. So obviously I'm super excited to actually get around to interviewing him. It's been a long time coming, one of my all-time triathlon heroes. Um, And I'm really excited for you to hear this interview, so stick around for that later on. So how have you been? How's your week been, everybody? There's a lot of uncertainty around in the world at the moment, that's for sure. Waiting for Boris's announcements and trying to find out what's happening. And as things stand, as I'm recording at the start of this week, Outlaw X is still on. As far as we can tell, all the information from um, from the briefings is all showing that Outlaw X is still going to be happening. So massive fingers crossed for that. I'm super excited to get down there. Even though I'm not racing this year, I'm going to be down um, in a coaching capacity, socially distanced, of course. And we've got over 40 athletes racing from Team Oxygen Addict. So it's a great opportunity for me to get to meet them. And we were all really hoping to have a sort of massive end of year party and a big get together, which we're obviously not going to be able to do now. But a lot of people are going to be able to meet people in the flesh that they've only interacted with online for the past year. Um, so we're not be able to all get together, but still, I'm really looking forward to getting down there uh, and watching the racing and watching people really sort of make the most of the end of summer and hopefully make the most of the fitness that they've built up over the, the months that have just happened. So yeah, watch this space for more about that. All right, this week's news and results is brought to us by Precision Hydration. If you've not taken that online sweat test yet, get on it. Get over to precisionhydration.com, take their online sweat test, and that'll give you a good lead as to whether you're a very heavy or a very salty sweater. Now, something that they've just mentioned to me is there's a link in the show notes. You can book a free hydration call with one of their hydration experts. 20 minutes, completely free of charge and free of obligation, just to talk through your needs and the kind of things you need to consider when you're racing and training. So it's a massive opportunity to uh, to take care of that and talk to someone who really knows what they're talking about. Usually they're out on the road and obviously they can't do that at the moment. So they're offering these 20 minute free calls over Skype. So there's a link in our show notes to book through to that. If you mention to them that you've heard about the booking on the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast, when you book, you'll be entered into a free draw to win a 50 pound precision hydration bundle. So that's awesome. Now these guys make electrolytes in different strengths. So if you're really heavy or really salty sweater, you can have the 15 milligram sodium ones, 1500 milligram sodium, sorry. If you're a normal person, a thousand milligram or 500 milligrams is going to suit you better, but you need to either talk to them or take the test to find out which is most suitable for you. Normal electrolytes that just come from other companies are not really, are not 
not really, but they are not at all strong enough to replace what we lose in our sweat, especially if you're a heavy or salty sweater, certainly like I am. So for me, pH was a changing factor that really revolutionized my training and racing because I was losing 1600 milligrams of sodium in every liter. So even just drinking a normal Gatorade, I was replacing 250 milligrams in a liter, nowhere near enough. So no surprise, I was really, really ill and out of it at the end of really hot, long races. So anyway, get over there, check them out, precisionhydration.com. So some results from the weekend for you. A couple of great races happened that are supported by the PTO. And again, they've, they've ponied up around 15,000 euros or dollars or pounds in each, in each case. First up was the Pushing Limits Olympic distance race over in Germany. Uh, that was taken out by Gustav Eiden ahead of Peter Heimrich and Frederick Funk. Um, over on the ladies' side, wins for Lisa Norden, ahead of Imogen Simmons and Lucy Hall. So cracking racing over there. Great to see some big money put on the line and for the pros to be able to make a decent living there. And then over in the USA, they had what's called, and I love the name of this, the Bear Lake Brawl. I don't know if you've seen pictures of this, but it looks like the French Alps. It's the most incredible blue colored water. Now, not so much this year on race day because it was very stormy and they had high winds and the start got delayed and all kinds of stuff. So the pictures you'll actually see of race day don't look anything like as dramatic and beautiful as the photos beforehand. But I encourage you to check that out. And if you're a listener in America, really check out this race because it looks like a stunning location to go and, and, and get racing in. Results over there from this race. On the men's side, we had a win for Sam Long. He took it out in 340, ahead of Matt Hansen in 344, and Justin Metzler in 345. So close racing there from those guys. We also had in the field Chris Lieferman, Ben Canute. I read on Ben Canute's Instagram that I think he was going really well on the on the swim and the bike, and, and he basically was absolutely freezing cold and just couldn't get himself warmed up. In the ladies' race, we had a win for Danielle Dingman ahead of Sky Mensch and Holly Benner. So again, great work from the PTO. Good news that they're getting that money out there to support the pros. And obviously, it's been a very difficult race for year for them this year in order to try and make any sort of living. Coming up this weekend, there's another race in Spain supported by them. There's another 15,000 euros on the line at the Spanish Middle Distance Champs happening in Bilbao. Javier Gomez is racing amongst others. Um, and also, obviously, this weekend, there's another 15,000 euros on the line at Outlaw X. So we've got names on the men's side, Ali Brownlee, Adam Bowden, Tim Don racing on the ladies' side, Nikki Bartlett, Kat Matthews. So some really big names racing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very hopeful to get down there and, uh, and be socially distanced and see some of the action as it goes by. Uh, yeah, so if you guys are racing this weekend, I really hope you have a great race. I really hope you enjoy it. And I think that's the most important thing. And that's what I want to talk to in Coach's Couch this week. The reason that I'm going to address this, obviously we did, I'm saying obviously, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, go back and listen to it again. We talk all about race preparation and race tapering and, and everything in terms of the mechanics of how to prepare for your race. Right now, what I want to talk about is something that's popped up a lot in our Facebook group and in some private emails from athletes is anxiety around race day. So people who are racing this coming weekend, some of them are feeling a lot of anxiety around this, the return to racing. Some of my athletes who've raced at other races have also addressed this in calls with me this week and said, look, I got to the race and it just felt really weird. The racks were either miles apart and it felt strange or they weren't far enough apart and it felt strange. Everyone was wearing masks and it felt strange. We had to wear masks to rack in and it felt strange. The socially distanced aspect of the start of the swim with people going in one by one felt strange. And a couple of athletes who have raced have said to me, look, at, I just wasn't feeling it during the race. I was riding along and I just didn't really know what was going on, but I couldn't sort of fully commit to it. So... Really what I'm saying to you here is if you are racing this coming weekend, we need to prepare ourselves mentally for the fact it's going to be different to how it's been and it's possibly going to be different to how we expect it to be. So let's spend a little bit of time mentally preparing for how this is going to be different to how races have been in the past. So like I've said, Outlaw X in particular is going to have massive transitions. They've got a huge amount of space. So that in itself is going to be weird and might give you some sort of 
low level subconscious anxiety. The fact people are wearing masks around is, is going to do the same. Aid stations are going to be different both on the bike and on the run in terms of having to get off your bike to get bottles and having to use hand gel for both aid stations on the bike and the aid stations on the run. So spend a little bit of time mentally rehearsing that because our brain finds it difficult to tell the difference between things we've imagined and things we've seen. So the idea of mental rehearsal is very much that if you practice it in your head and you practice thinking through and I really do mean think this through, picture the images that you think you'll see. Your brain can become much more attuned and much more ready for what's actually going to happen than if you just turn up and things are different. So picture what an aid station on the bike is going to look like. Picture the fact you're going to have to hang your bike up on a rack and go and collect a bottle yourself, or you're going to have to collect a gel yourself, and you're going to have to walk through the aid station rather than riding through and people handing it to you. Picture the aid station on the run being you have to get hand gel on your hands and collect your water or gel or whatever it is yourself, and the volunteers are standing way back away from you. And the more you prepare yourself for this, the more you're going to feel comfortable come race day, okay? Carry as much as you can, as much of what you need as you can, and that'll minimize the amount of time you're going to have to spend in the aid stations. But the more that you practice this in your head, the more comfortable you're going to feel come race day. And I think it is natural, there's some anxiety around this. It's, you know, we're living in very strange times at the moment. But especially in, in the the case of Outlaw Rex, it's a huge area if you've not been there before. It's a massive private country estate with a, oh, there must be 50 football fields worth of space between the great house and where the lake is. And the, you know, there's tons of distance and loads of space for people to be around and to be safely socially distant. So as long as everyone's sensible, I don't think there are very many actual threats to you there might be some perceived threats in your mind in terms of safety but i think being outdoors being really spread out from people as long as we're sensible i think a lot of that stuff is taken care of and remember events been ratified by british triathlon and they've got some pretty stringent covid guidelines to allow any kind of events to go ahead so the fact it's been given the go ahead is a really massive big tick in the box that can make you feel a bit more comfortable um, so listen, just a little shout out for our coaching company, Team Oxygen Addict, on the back of this. We've got over 40 people racing this weekend. So if you see some of the guys when you're out there, they're all dead friendly. Say hello and give them a give them a shout, not an actual physical pat on the back, but say hello and encourage each other. Um, if you like what you see, if you like what you hear, if you like the idea of getting some triathlon coaching for next year, we would love to have you on board with us. We've got what we think is probably the most comprehensive triathlon coaching program for busy age groupers out there. We've, we've thought of everything. It, I've used this phrase before, joined up thinking. It's not a separate swim plan, bike plan, and run plan. You know, you can go to train a road and do some workouts on there, but it's not all designed to tie in your bike fitness with your run fitness and build your bike fitness at a time when your run fitness is doing something different. So I don't want you to fall between the stools and try and get fit in all the sports all at the same time. Let's have a joined up approach to your triathlon training. That way we can guarantee the results are going to come in the fastest possible way. And in the places where we haven't got expertise, we've teamed up with official partners who are the leaders in the area. So we've teamed up with HRV for training. So all our plans have got HRV guidance in that tell you how to adapt your training plan based on how your body's parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system is responding to training load. So if you're too tired to train, you might not necessarily feel it, but you'll see an HRV guidance and it's an essential part of training effectively. We've teamed up and partnered with the performance chef, Alan Murchison. He gives our athletes meal plans that directly tie in with our workouts. So you get recovery meals on a recovery day and you get, you know, meals with more energy on a day when you've got an FTP session. So that's a massive, massive thing that would usually cost a lot of money and is free for our members. We teamed up with Matt Bottrell bike fitting, so we get a discount on his bike fits and the benefit of his knowledge in order to you know get you as fast as we can be. And we've also teamed up with Precision Hydration, so we've got personalized hydration calls. There's a lot in there that ties in more than just a training plan. Okay, so if you want to find out more, give us a call. There's a link in the show notes. You can have a chat with me or one of the team and find out how our coaching works in more detail and how it's suitable for you. 
And finally, if you join before the end of September, you can get in for 2020 prices. That's currently £997 for the total year of coaching, that whole package. It's going to be increasing to 1197 at the end of this month on the 1st of October. So what we do as well is you keep the price for as long as you're a continuous member. So you're sort of insulated from any future raises in price that we have to implement. You can also train with us on Swift Tuesdays at 7.15 p.m. UK time, the Oxygenetic Triathlon Podcast Power Hour. Come along, sample some of our training plans on the bike. Yeah, so great stuff. All right, hope you guys really love that. Before we go into interview of the week, I just want to give a shout out to Thriver. They do brilliant at-home finger prick blood tests. It's dead simple. It gets posted through your door. You prick your finger. You squeeze a few drops into a tiny test tube. You label it. You put it in a pre-sent envelope thing. And you can be off to the post office within five minutes of opening the box, literally. I've timed this myself. And I'm a doofus. If I can do it, anybody can. They can test all manner of things in your blood that's essential for athletes and also essential for health. So if you're wondering about things like your iron levels, testosterone levels, liver function, vitamin B9 and B12 and vitamin D, or health-specific stuff like thyroid function or diabetes or cholesterol or female hormones or omega-3 and 6, every single thing you can imagine that you could get tested, you can get tested here. You can pick from a menu. They're all reasonably priced and you only pay for the ones that you want. Um, I think it's a brilliant service and it really helped me personally get on top of some health issues I was having when I was really, really depleted and low in testosterone and iron when I switched to a vegan diet a couple of years ago. Nothing against vegan diets. It was all about my cooking and my inability to cook the right stuff. Um, So yeah, if you've got anything going on with your health or even really if you just want to kind of body MOT, check them out over at thriver.co. You can get 10% off using uh, the code oxygen addict 10 it's as simple as that okay so great stuff check them out and that being said let's head on over to our interview of the week with iron man legend dave scott dave scott the legend the man the myth welcome to the oxygen addict triathlon podcast it's great to have you on mate how are you doing today uh, pretty well, Rob. Uh, it's nice kind of briefly chatting uh, as we're getting warmed up here for the show. But it, um, yeah, things, uh, you know, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year professionally, I think, for our sport. It's been such a challenge. I'm, I'm on a call. I was on every Monday, really from the outset, from March with Ironman and trying to whittle through their events. And, you know, how do we how do we do this? And, and events were on the docket. And then canceled, you know, two days later because of an outbreak. And, you know, fortunately, we're, we're seeing a, a little more normalcy. I don't know even what that word means anymore, but <laughs> it, it's been a hard year. Uh, it's been a challenging year professionally. Um, so, but hopefully we'll all get through this. Well, it does feel as though there's some, there's some rays of hope at the moment. There's been some pro racing happened. There's been, you know, the PTO have put some money into races and we've seen certainly in the UK, we saw a, a pro field at Helvellyn, which was great. You know, Ali Brownlee showed up and Joe Skipper was there and loads of other pros Um, really deep field on the girls side. And, um, you know, it was, it was just great that the sense of, Oh, racing's happening again. You know, they put some money into, I saw the Spanish middle distance championships is coming up this weekend. Yeah. There's prize money at Outlaw yes, X in the UK. It. So it does feel as though there's a, we need this normal stuff in order to feel positive and normal, don't we? Do you find that as well in the States? <laughs> has it been the same over there? Oh, people were, were just jumping out of their shoes, you know, ready to reignite the, the racing uh, action again. And, and that momentum was, you know, like a crazy roller coaster. And I think a lot of people were preparing and it's not just the physical part, you know, hopefully you're, you're kind of doing that and you can click the big switch, getting ready to race, but it's just the, the, the mental anxiety of, of not having that. And, and the regularity of saying, well, I'm going to do X number of races. I mean, fortunately, not all of Europe, but a lot of it where the races are scheduled and have been underway. You know, we've seen them underway now for about seven weeks. It's been real spotty, you know, of, of the, uh, the PTO races, um, you know, they, they've done a, just an amazing, admirable job. I mean, first off, paying the pros during a COVID year, which is, you know, people are going, wow, how, how can you do this? And, 
And, um, and to, to offer that to the athletes, it's almost like a step back. You, you really shouldn't be doing this. You can't be doing this, but uh, you know, what, what a glorious gesture. And then also to have the race as a schedule and devotion, you know, they had um, issues with the weather and they paid out on that. And, you know, I, I think, um, as you just mentioned, the most recent race with the superstars and I, you know, I did a podcast with Alistair and, and he, he's in the same quandary. He's a racing machine. You know, he said, it's nice not traveling, but yet there's a big void without the races. You diffuse that down to all the amateurs that are waiting in the wings. You know, we like to see the world's best race because it gives us spirit. It gives us momentum. It makes us feel whole. And, and, you know, hopefully, that the amateurs will have an opportunity as, as, as they are. And those races are, you know, hopefully going to open up a lot more as, as 2021 uh, unfolds. Yeah. Well, I know a load of the guys that I work with are racing out Lorex this coming weekend and, and Alistair Brownlee said he's racing there and people genuinely can't believe we've got a two time Olympic champion turning up to, you know, it's a big event. There's a couple of thousand people there, but you don't usually get Alistair Brownlee turning up at a, end of september triathlon in the uk it's going to be amazing <laughs> yeah no i think i think it's great and I, you know alistair he's a he's a super guy and you know he, he he has that uh sort of indifference towards people and things but at the same time he, you know he's like all of us he's built the same he's 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 wired that you know i'm a race dog i, I you know i just want to put myself up there maybe i'm not ready and and these other guys are ready to knock me off and 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 he's he's a mark guy as you said he's the you know i don't know how many world cups he's run and won and two gold medals and you know everyone knows he's there when he steps up to the starting line but yet it's in his blood and if he can feel good about himself he'll bring up his competitive level and, and when that really ignites, people better be ready again because he, he's not done. So, yeah, I think it's wonderful he's coming out. And, and the fact that he's doing it late in the year right now where a lot of people, you know, do have an off season. And obviously he went to, to Ironman last year. Uh, and, and I know he wants redemption in that race as well. So, you know, I love seeing the pro men and women back out there sort of going at it. And, I, and, and honestly, I – I, I don't think people are really looking at, gee, who really won that race? Who had the greatest race? Who's in tremendous fitness? Because we don't have the world championships in lots of different forms and distances. It's just the sheer opportunity to race and race as hard as you can and give it your all and have a beer at the end of the day. <laughs> so we're talking to the person here who essentially – didn't exactly invent professional triathlon, but you were there right at the start, weren't you? You were, you were the winner of Ironman Hawaii in 1980, which was the third year that it happened. And you, I mean, you came along and I think you were two hours faster than the previous winner when you first came and did it. So what do you think when you look at the PTO and, and how they're approaching the sort of professionalization of the sport? Because I'm imagining you really did see it right from the very start and you were scraping together a living doing whatever you could to support your own racing right yeah absolutely and i'll say we the old guys like myself i seem to be the oldest you know we we tried to get a, a professional triathlon organization way back in the 80s really and we sort of yeah and we sort of rallied we there were no emails then computers weren't around. So we're exchanging notes and phone calls and saying, let's do it. But it was typically around a race. And, and we had the rate, same race conviction and race faces as the superstars of today. It's not, you know, you didn't really co-mingle and you weren't, you know, great mates <laughs> yeah. because you're competitive. So to, to organize really a command central that said, Hey, as professional athletes, we need a governing body. I think we all had good intention, but like the PTO, the huge difference is that they have business people. They have a, they have a business, it's a business entity. They have a business mind and they know how to not only solicit the athletes, which they've done a glorious job of, but also sponsors and TV and, and rights and, 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 you know, ultimately the PTO is going to create this marketing table 
and platform for the events and the athletes. And I, you know, I, I can look at it, look at, you know, the, some of the biggest events and certainly being involved with Ironman for a long time. And I look back at this last year, what an opportunity missed. Unfortunately, it was really missed. Alistair Brownlee, double gold, just venturing out in the Ironman distance, had gotten a few 70.3s and obviously had put a stamp on those and racing against his old nemesis, Jan Ferdano, who stepped up and, and, and it has all these other world titles, including Ironman. And now they're going head to head. I just felt like what an amazing story. And I have great admiration for both of them, totally different personalities. Uh, if they're in the same room, it's it, it, they're, they're black and white, but when they're on, and I think they have mutual respect for each other, which is a great thing as I did with Mark Allen. Uh, but I just felt like, gosh, their stories putting their athletic history and their personal history as much as you want to dissect from that and then bring them to the starting line together. I just said, this is a, such an amazing story. PTO is going to be putting those stories together and present that to the public, not just on, you know, race day, but it's going to build like we see in some of the sports, which are obviously easier to film. And we can look at golf and tennis as two models and, and a lot of the modeling has come, you know, from from golf, particularly for, yeah, for the PTO. So, uh, you know, I just I heard about it initially from Charles Adamo. He, he was organized. I said, oh, boy, I was playing devil's advocate. I don't think it's going to work, you know, because I, I tried. <laughs> we tried and, and we failed miserably. And I think we failed, you know, the athletes that followed us for a couple generations. I mean, we're talking in the eighties and the nineties when I raced and some of my cohorts raced through the nineties. And then, you know, there's been this big hiatus 20 plus years where we've needed the organization for the sport. And, and now it's here. What was it that originally got you into the idea of doing an Ironman? Cause at the time it was a, it was less than a niche sport, wasn't it? The first one happens and there's 11 or 12 people take part. I've always wondered how you ended up, were you living in California at the time, how you ended up in, in Hawaii to go and do the event? Can you tell that story for us, please? Well, I'll try to make it short, Rob. I don't want to bore you. You take as long uh, as you want. I've got Dave <laughs> Scott on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll take a few minutes. Uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. I did a race in 76 and and people could say it was a triathlon, but there was no name for it. People, there wasn't a name like that. We're going to do a triathlon and the order was all scrambled. And it was in San Francisco Bay. And I've told this story many times. It was frigid. The water was like your water, uh, you know, just jumping in, but with no it's wet suits. cold there, isn't it? It's, it's cold. cold. Water. You know, the, the water was 12 degrees. The air temperature was 12 degrees. And, and yeah. we're all running around in our little swim briefs. The, the, the start of it, and I'll say it was 15K, uh, nine miles on the bike, no, no setup, there was no transition, no police, no monitors, no people at intersections, just go out there and do it and good luck. And it was in a real ramshackle, dilapidated area in San Francisco. So this is 76. I got off the bike. I, I didn't know I was going to run. My knee was bothering. I went over to my car, opened up the trunk, pulled out some shoes I thought were my running shoes. And went out on the run. The run was sort of an out and back and about 7K, four miles. And then the third leg was the swim in the bay. And, you know, hitting that <laughs> high school <laughs> water. I think three guys were ahead of me. And I think they froze to death. One guy was hanging on the anchor in a ship. And uh, he had, you know, a full body cramp. And he was nearly dead. And I just said, well, that's a race. I got to keep going. Uh, I did see him. So that was my first race, 76, 70. Moving ahead, 78 was the first Ironman. I read about it. Uh, there was an article uh, actually after the 79 race in Sports Illustrated. And a friend of mine, Mike, said, you got to do this. He said, you know, you just like working out all day. You picked up running pretty quickly. I mean, I hadn't run a marathon then. I ran a marathon in September of 79, did the Ironman race January 80. I remember running in Sacramento, no shirt. I don't think I stopped at the aid station and just – ran 26 miles and, and uh, ran 245. And I said, well, that's not too bad. Uh, you know, I can do this Ironman race and sort of put together a, uh, a mock mini triathlon that I did. And I, I flipped around the order similar to what I did in my first one. 
I did a, it was a hundred, hundred mile century ride. And I did that and I ran 20 miles and I swam 5,000 yards, which is uh, obviously excessive. And I did that sort of a, as a prelude to the January 80 race. But that particular race, uh, we, we were all, you know, pretty blind to what was going to happen. And it's not, it's not really the best word choice, but we didn't really know what was going to unfold, um, you know, during the race. And then, I kind of went into it, I guess, with a uh, with a, an ignorance and not, not arrogance that I'm just going to go as hard as I could. And, you know, what's the worst thing? Well, I just have to slow down and I'll finish. And so I, I just sort of went flat out from the beginning. And there were several. There was an NC2A swimmer who had beaten me many, many times in swimming. And he was in the race, Tom Bowie. And I was ahead on the swim, so I never saw anyone for the rest of the day. It was just... <laughs> Just wow. a long time, long time trial. And, you know, again, at that time in the two preceding years, it was a real ha- ragtag set of athletes. We could hardly call ourselves triathletes because the sport didn't have a name. But 1980, I think not the fact that I won, but it was covered by ABC Wildlife Sports. People knew about it. It certainly planted a seed for me, and that started my career. Well, I had to look around on YouTube for it, and and I can't find the 1980 race on YouTube. The 81 race is on there, but I couldn't find the 1980 race. So some, I want to show you this. I'm sure you've seen it. Have you you got this this old Bob Babbitt book? Oh yeah, of course. I had so that there's old some book and some great some old shots, shots in there. Yeah, some black and white ones with your dad following you in the, the old station wagon with a spare bike strapped on the roof and just amazing do you remember what your splits were in that first race off the top uh, of your head I, I i don't really remember i i, I think i was there was a huge uh, storm and, and so the swim was changed it went to uh, alamoana park i think i was 50 minutes or 50 maybe 51 minutes i think it was 50 minutes something and then the bike was quite shockingly slow um uh five <laughs> no, it- five hours and Five hours and 20 minutes. Does that sound right? Or five, five, oh, five, three, Dave. Oh, five, oh, five, three. Oh, three. <laughs> oh, five, oh, three. Oh, okay. Five, oh, three. Well, I should have gone four fifty nine. That would have sounded better. <laughs> and then the, uh, the, the run, uh, the, the run was quite slow. I, that, that did bother me because we had a couple way stations. I think the run was like three twenty three. Is that sound right? Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah. yeah. For nine twenty four overall. Right. So the, <laughs> pretty darn slow. I'm glad Chrissy Wellington wasn't around. Uh, <laughs> she would have, she would have whooped me. Uh, but that was, you know, was a significant drop. And, you know, I, when I did that race, I <clears throat> probably within 10 minutes after I finished, I, I you know, again, I, 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 I was so revved up, not from necessarily winning. I just felt like this is what I was sort of bred to do. I can't wait to do another one. So, and I said to myself, I can go a lot faster. So the time standard from 79 was 11 hours something. And I went nine twenty three. Yeah. And it was a significant drop, but nowhere close to where, you know, I sort of ended up in my career where the athletes are racing now. So at that point, obviously there's no, there's no professional setup. There's hardly any prize money. Are you still working, supporting yourself as a swim coach and entering whatever triathlons pop up for prize money at the weekend? I mean, I've, I've heard these little stories that Tinley and Melina have told on, on different shows. It sounds like it was, it was a fun time to be around, but a hard time to make a professional living. <laughs> well, the profession and professional part of it really didn't come around. Um, after winning that 1980 race, I had a, a roommate who was a law student yeah, Jay and Jay said, I'm going to send out letters. There was no emails to fortune 500 companies because you got to get a sponsorship. And he sent out a stack of letters. And one of the ones that he had reached out to was Timex. You know, Timex was, was far from being involved in the sport. And they were one of two that responded and said, well, kind of sort of an offhand compliment. Well, this is pretty admirable. Uh, Dave Scott, uh, Mr. Scott sounds like he's a quite an athlete, but yeah, you know, I'm sure they thought you know, maybe it was a sociopath or some crazy <laughs> lunatic or something, but you know, we, we'd like to support, but we're really not involved in good luck. You know, it was just one of those real superficial comments, but it was kind of ironic that, you know, Timex has sold about a hundred million watches yeah, uh, and, and came to the sport later on. So the, the early pickings, I was, I was coaching swimming after I got out of college 
And that's what I continue to do. But in the latter part of 81, I said, I, I just got to do this sport without, <laughs> with a blind ambition and no money. And, and there were six races, I think six, in 1982, it was part of the Bud Light uh, United States Triathlon Series. Okay, and These were shorter races, a little longer than what's the Olympic distance. They were about 2K swim. Uh, the bike, I think, was uh, around 50K and the run was 15K. So it tacked on another half hour to 45 minutes on you know, times on the Olympic distance. I, I won all six of those. Scott Molina, Scott Tinley, Mark Allen appeared in those races. And so I, I was a, a, aware of them and they you know, became uh, close rivals over the next uh, <laughs> long period of time within the sport. So that, that was kind of the start. So I, I won those six, I got $6,000, six times 500. And my first uh, contract was with Nike and I got a similar amount. I got $500 a month. I said, this is amazing. I've won 6,000, I've got 6,000 from Nike. I, I am on my way to being a professional triathlete. And I awesome. ended up win, winning in October of, of 82 at the Ironman race. And of course there was no prize money then, Rob. I mean, it was yeah. the first pr first prize money was at the race was on my fifth win. Really? A, a, yeah, a local guy. <laughs> who lives along Elite Drive. I think he felt sorry for us. He said, gosh, these guys work bloody hard. They should get paid for it. And, <laughs> and, and all I got were, were four t-shirts in the first four Ironman victories. He put up $8,000 in 1986. I won. I got that $8,000. I had some sponsor money. And, and I said, you know, I'm well on my way. And I was getting uh, appearance money at that at that time to, to go overseas. And and there were other races that started having prize money. But Ironman was way behind the game. It, same guy put up money in 87. It was $10,000. So wow. I got $18,000. I never did really thank this guy with a handshake. But I, I said, well, that, I think it embarrassed Ironman to, you know, start putting money up. And in 88, there was money. It's interesting that, that Nike were behind sponsoring what was a, you know, a very, very niche sport at the time. I mean, way back in the day, because they were only a, a relatively new company back then, weren't they? I just read the CEO's book a little while ago, and, and I didn't quite yeah. realize quite how, I mean, what do they call it? Shoe stringing or bootstrapping when you, you pull a, a new company together. But he kind of started it with a $5,000 loan and some rebadged ASIC shoes from, from Japan. So that's how did the Nike thing come about? Well, they, yeah, you know their history. You read his book and he made that waffle trainer and we started running. And there wasn't a myriad of hundreds of choices and everyone just started <laughs> raving about that company and IKE and how do you say it? And they got some cool shoes. Uh, I don't know. I just reached out to them and they, I mean, they started growing pretty darn fast and um, you know, triathlon wasn't developed at all, but I think there was someone in the marketing department. I remember him very well, Hans Albanop, and he kind of had a, a mindset that we want to bring in these, maybe these fringe sports and this one's getting TV coverage. And this guy, Dave Scott has won a couple of these, let's sponsor them. And, and I just thought, you know, this is the most glorious thing I could ever have in my entire life. I went up to uh, Portland where uh, Beaverton, Oregon, where their location is and went through their warehouse and he was pulling clothes off and shoes. And I, I just felt it was wrong. I said, you can't do, I don't deserve all this. <laughs> and I was getting a paycheck. So I, I just thought, wow, this, this is really something, but it didn't, this, this sport is, uh, you know, it moves quickly, you know, people, characters change and then all of a sudden that contract dissolves. So uh, it's, it's been a, a wave of contracts in my career and I could write a book on that. Um, <laughs> some very, nasty, vile people and some be beautiful people that have helped me along the way. So it's uh, oh, man. kind of a ruthless business. Looking back over the races that you had in Hawaii, which of the races are you most proud of? Oh, wow. Now, Rob, that's a darn good question. Uh, I remember all of them because I'm having to recite different things about the event and how it unfolded and, uh, I, I, you know, my sense was that 
mentally I, I, I started having to dig at different levels because every, every race scenario was totally different. In 83, I was just totally decimated over the last five miles of the run. And, and I was able to get ahead of Scott Tinley and, and I, I nearly collapsed at the end. The footage on that is quite funny because I was yeah. ra- w- <laughs> raising my finger up to sort of acknowledge the crowd. This is the last 100 meters coming into the finish line. And I almost fell over and I said, well, <laughs> I'm thinking cut the theatrics, just get across the line. And Tinley was bearing down on me 33 seconds behind. So, you know, I, re- I remember 82 coming back. There was two races. I won in 83. That was a very close race. And, 84, I had, you know, a pretty solid day all the way through and kind of dominated that race. And uh, 86 had the fastest time for a while. And, you know, all those years I remember. And, and I, I did a podcast yesterday with Mark. I, we've done a, a zillion podcasts on 89. Everyone wants to talk about the 89 race. And I said, well, let's talk about 87. I caught Mark in that race. <laughs> uh, got him at 22 miles. And, and of course, everyone knows the outcome of 89. It turned out to be, a, you know, an historic race. And, you know, I, you know, I enjoy chatting about it. Um, and every time, you know, I hear Mark talk about it or the insight of a, who's ever producing it, there's always, you know, telling questions to get to your question. I think the two that really meant the most to me were my last two. Um, okay. The 94 race, I, from 89, I got second to Mark and then I had those five years and my two boys were born and I, I actually was wrestling with an injury and also mentally I was having trouble just thinking that I, don't know if I want to do it. And then I'll, I, I had a sort of the impetus was by Dave McGilvery who puts on the Boston marathon and same age. He was there in the 80 race. And he said, Dave, I know you still want to do this. Go back to Hawaii and race again. And so he, he's the one who, who told me I was 38 plus plus go back when you're 40 and that'll really mean something. And, you know, at the time there were very few 40 year olds racing at a professional level or competing at a professional level in anywhere, any yeah. sport. And so I just said, you know, I don't feel old. I'm going to do this, but it took a long time to come up. I got second that race behind the great Greg Welch and, you know, frustrated with a lousy run. I was like, <laughs> it's not bad apples, but I didn't run. I didn't run well. And he ran away from me and that's competition. But that race, the circumstances and the hiatus I had and, and uh, my two boys were there and that was kind of quite a day. And, and then, Two years later, I, I went back in 96 and it had plans on racing in 95 and I broke my toe with a weight that I dropped on my foot uh, in the gym. So that was out. 96 went back and and I, I I remember very, very vividly, I just said, I'm in better shape. You know, I was kind of mad at myself for not running to my capability in 94. And Greg had a solid run, but not brilliantly fast and not as fast as I had gone in the 80s. So I said, I'm capable of running fast again. And, and, and I felt my swim and my bike were, were there as well, but <laughs> the race didn't unfold that way, Rob. I, I, I floundered on the swim. I could see the people around me and I said, well, I recognize this guy and that guy and, and this woman, and I, I'm faster than them, but I'm not today. I'm not, I'm caught in this sea of piranhas. And, and so when I got out of the swim, I knew I didn't have a very good swim, but I said, oh, I'm going to take off on the bike. And I, I just didn't have a go power on the bike finally mentally rallied well into the bike. I kind of felt sorry for myself and, and, you know, I was doing very poorly. I was being passed and people were trying to pull me along. Come on, Dave, come on, come on, come on. And they'd go by standing still. But I finally, finally dawned on me that, you know, that whatever mental, mental perseverance that I had and throughout my career, my life, I just said, you know, just, you, you have this amazing opportunity. You're going to run a marathon. And you're going to run it bloody fast. So get ready to go, Dave. And that was my that was my instinct. That was my motivation. It, it really wasn't, you know, the Ironman race. It was just I got I'm going to pass a lot of people. I'm going to go mad right from the beginning. So I just came out of the blocks of the transition T2, and immediately started passing guys that seemed to be decimated on the run. And my goal was I thought I was maybe in 50th place and never in a position like that in Hawaii. And I thought if I can get in the top 10, this is going to be the most amazing day. And that was, that was what I was thinking. I just keep picking them off. And then I started getting numbers from my friends and family. You know, you're at 16, you're at 15. Yeah. So 
I caught number 10 at about 16 miles. And then I caught the fifth guy around 21 or 22. And, and now I was in fifth place. And I, I just felt like I was just warming up for a 5k. I just wanted the, the run to last another 40k and I might've caught the, caught the winners. <laughs> so coming in fifth, those two races um, were in, in some ways emotionally the most you know, the highlight of my career, and I would say not just because they were at the end, but it was just the timing and the circumstances. Okay. Well, you very modestly haven't mentioned that you ran 245 in that race. Mm, and it was, yeah. it was only for Luke Van Leerd winning and breaking the course record. And, and I think he went 240, just under 242 that day to go 804 overall. You were the, you know, you were the second fastest run by a country mile. There was no one else under two fifty that day. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was a hot day. I remember, but I don't. I, I seem to always do well, obviously, in the heat. Mm. And it was just, I think, the internal motivation, and you know, it's kind of what I wanted to run. It wasn't as fast as what I'd run in eighty nine with Mark. But I thought, well, forty two. Maybe you give yourself an allowance. <laughs> two forty five was okay. <laughs> I know Mike Riley, who's announcing the race, he was so caught off guard. We've joked about this because I heard his announcement. I'm, I'm, I'm just blasting across the finish line thinking that maybe the fourth guy might have stumbled and I'll pass him. So I was still moving pretty fast all the way to the finish. And I heard Mike just at the very end, I, and I think he caught a, a voice from the side. It's Dave Scott. He's coming in. And, and Mike was in disbelief because he knew I was – way, way, way back on the bike and just thought, you know, I was completely out of the race or I, I had quit. So he, he was able to pick me up over the last two meters. <laughs> Love it. So it's interesting to me that, you know, you've got this reputation six times when a Uber competitor, but the, the things that have given you the most satisfaction are not actually the wins. It's not the times when you've beaten people. It's, it's more the performances where you feel as though you know, the performance has been as good as you can give on the day almost? Uh, I, I think so. I think there's, uh, there, you know, there's an interesting element when people think that you're invincible mm. and you have this cloud of invincibility and that no one can touch you and you're always here, you're always up at, at the, you know, this this level above everyone else. And and I and I, I wrestled with that, sort of you know misconception but it was really just me it didn't it wasn't really the journalists and everyone else who said this it was sort of the the fear of of uh perfection in a lot of ways and so perfection is a real fine needle and i don't think anyone's ever perfect and you know i could ask alistair brown did you have a perfect race in your double goals and you say no way uh my six wins no way but you, you end up rallying mentally to override whatever, whatever is working against you and, and, and to take on your competitor. But during the times that I was not racing, I wrestled with depression quite badly. And that depression, it, it ruled my life. Really? And, yeah. And, it, um, and I haven't been able to talk about it for a long time. I have in the recent uh, last few years, maybe. Um, but I, I, I had it quite bad and my family knows it well. My parents knew it. My sisters did my close friends and I, and I would sort of lean on them. I mean, I did, I think to a much greater degree than I'm going to credit by that last sentence, but I would have periods where if, if I had a, an hour and a half run scheduled f for my training, I, I couldn't downgrade it to 50 minutes because that was quitting that was below the perfection and and it was it really when you're looking at perfection you're also looking at the fear of failure and so i felt as though i i, I was i was failing so it was all or nothing it's no it's no different than any disease that you know people have whether you're an alcoholic you, you go over the top you take one one or two too many drinks and now you've done it I was the same way. I, I, and it's hard for people to understand, go out and exercise because it makes you feel better. I get it. Yeah. That is, I get it. I get it to the thousandth degree and I have a steadfast rule. Go 20 minutes. 
and do something, but do 20 minutes a day because you're going to get this morphine like effect and, and it will satiate you. But back then it was all or nothing. And so the, the nothing part of it was, okay, I won't do it today. And it was a self-inflicted punishment that could carry on for days. And so I had a lot of those currents throughout the years that I won the Ironman. People didn't know about them because what they'd see is Dave Scott is amazing on Ironman day. He can do it. So it's almost like you pro- projected a kind of aura of invincibility, but behind that, there'd be times when you just curl up in your own house and no one would be able to reach you at all. It, that's exactly right. And, and I, it, you're, my, my confidence and self-esteem would just erode down to zero. So I didn't want to talk to anyone. I yeah. couldn't you know, do a podcast one around it, and rock, but, you know, <laughs> to speak to someone else, I, I could, I could rally myself, but boy, it took, it, it took the most willpower. And then I would really collapse into this mental bog a- afterwards. And, you know, it's, I, I, I think a lot of people think, oh, come on, come on, just pick yourself up. You can do it. But I have spoken to a, lo- a, a number of athletes that, the d- depression is, is quite prevalent and you certainly mm-hmm. read about it with athletes and, and actors and entertainers that can't sustain the pace and the expectation. But, and, and, but I, I actually think it's wherever that was planted with me. I, you know, I was, I, I remember taking, you know, tests when I was in school, I was in fourth grade, you know, and I, it was the age of your son. And I was thinking, oh man, I've got to do really well on this. You know, I worked myself into a frenzy and, you know, I've got this swim meet and my palms are sweating and I'm 10 years old. And, you know, it was just this expectation of, of, of doing well. And I, I and I'm not really, sure. <laughs> I don't want to blame my parents on it um, because they came from different backgrounds. And, uh, you know, I, it was just something that was ingrained in me very early on. You know, it's it's interesting to me. I've heard this story. I remember reading about, and, and this might be a, a cultural thing that hasn't reached America, but um, England won the World Rugby Cup back in 2003 with a kick by a guy called Johnny Wilkinson, who basically won it for us in the last few seconds. And he tells a similar story of being driven compulsively for perfection in that as a child, he'd be sick getting out of the car to go and play rugby. And he would compulsively take hundreds of kicks at the at the rugby goals to try and make sure he could do it when it really happened. And we kind of celebrate winners. We celebrate people who, you know, I want to be like Dave Scott or I want to be like Johnny mm-hmm. Wilkinson. But when you see behind the scenes a little bit, it makes me wonder whether people really would want to walk a mile in your shoes. Is, is the win, <laughs> is the win worth the, the drive and the compulsion to get there almost? And I think there's a lot more strength in talking about this, now and sort of saying, look, I, I struggled with this because so many people do struggle with it and assume they're on their own. There's so much strength in sharing that with people. Yes. Yeah, you're very eloquent with your, your words on that. And, it, and it, it does parallel my thoughts and Johnny's thoughts as, as well. I, through my whole athletic life, I was always doing extra. So it yeah. didn't matter when I was a younger kid, I would, I would swim more. I would run farther. I'd stay after with all my water polo mates and say, we got to do more strength training and bar dips and put that brick on your head. And I would yeah. run at night. I remember many, many times I was studying and, and I just do crazy things. Like I tell my roommate, this is in college. I say, Stan, I want you to time me. I'm going to get on my bike, pitch black outside. I'm going to go across town and back, you know, on a crummy old bike, time me. And, and I, you know, it was just, okay, well, I was a little bit slower this time, you know, I'm going to do it a couple of days later. It didn't matter what it was. I, I was crazy driven. And, and, and I think that that conviction, okay, I had success athletically, but I think in the whole scheme of, of health, it's, it's not the balance that you want to emulate. Yeah. And if, if I could rewrite the book, I would say there are times where you do want to just sort of flow along and l- let the little currents not upend you. And I know that sounds kind of fluffy and poetic, but I, I think I'm, I was always trying to be on my game and it was all or nothing. There was no gray area at all where I could just allow myself to be content. Yeah. yeah because I, I, I've had, um, 
you know, sort of an internal saying for a long time. I have a lot of them, but you know, I always thought that if you're complacent, that just breeds mediocrity. And, and so I can't be complacent at all. I, I've got to be excellent. And it, it, it drove me to being quite nutty. I mean, I, I saw um, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists diff- at different times where I would go in there and I, and I, you know, I really wasn't exactly sure because I couldn't really express it then. And I think it's difficult for people to understand when you can control it so easy. If, if you have normal habits and you're healthy and you go out for a walk, you know the reasons why you go out for a walk or you go out for a run, or you go out for a bike ride or a swim or, or, or whatever it may be, it makes you feel good. The equation is darn easy. It's real simplistic. But... <laughs> <laughs> the terms that I had were, well, that's not going to be satisfying. It cer- certainly doesn't bring gratification over a long period of time. So therefore, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to yeah. punish myself mentally, emotionally for being a loser right now. And I did that over and over and over again. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll back up a little bit on, on races. I, I had that to some degree, even in 89, and I had a little bit in 94 as well. And I was kind of summoned by friends just to, uh, you know, Dave, you got to get going. My son was born in 89. And, um, and you know, I'm sitting around the house thinking I can help my wife at the time with the infant. And I wasn't breastfeeding, so that was an issue. And uh, so it was almost like, well, get out the door and go exercise, get lost. And you know, I just kind of felt like, nah, I, I, this is the right thing to do. But at the same time, it was, it was tormenting me. Here I had yeah. a new son. It was beautiful. I was happily married at the time. And I just said, you know, this is crazy. But it was part of this mental game that caused a lot of demise and destruction. And it, it really yeah. took me a long time, even kind of right in the mid part of 94 where I almost fell back into it. And here I'm coming back when I was 40. I had a lot of momentum for that race. I just said, no, I'm just going to go out and exercise. And I kind of flipped the switch then. And, and I have to this date and I have to remind myself always, 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 doesn't matter how much stress you have, go do something. Mm. It's yeah. 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 It sounds like, it sounds like you've learned to be a lot kinder to yourself over the years, <laughs> whether it's, Mm, I don't know. Some of the time? Know. Some of the time, I think, Rob. I, you know, yeah. I, I don't really have that kind of stick hanging from, <laughs> from in the back of my head. Uh, you know, my kids always, they know this sort of manic behavior. And, you know, my kids are older now. They're adults. And they say, you know, are you still on this frenetic schedule, you know, scheduling a, a podcast, an amazing, you got to get this done. You've got to comply with this sponsor. You've you're on the plane the next, not this year, but you know, you're trying to squeeze in your workouts and mm. it's never, can you just relax? And I, and I hear this a lot. We started off just chatting about Drew, my son, who's now 29 and was a triathlete. And he's always saying, and he hits the core right away. He said, are you slowing down? Interesting. And it's not slowing down because I'm, you know, 66 point something. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really just, he's seen my pattern. He was in the sport. He saw my behavior even well after my competitive days and he was doing it. And he just said, you, you know, you're feeding this neurosis, this craziness, and you, you're just relentless. You don't give it up. And I still have that. I still have mm. that to this day. So to answer your question, you know, I, I think I've tempered it. I'm aware of it. You're aware of it. Yeah. I'm aware aware of it. Word, isn't it? Well, that's yeah, the first huge. step, isn't it? Being aware mm. that the, the, the things there, that the black dogs at the door, that's the first step of, you know, and you know what, Dave, we're never going to be perfect. That's a pretty high bar to shoot from. So maybe we just have to be a little bit better every day. <laughs> that sounds like a good mantra. I'll try to, I'll try to follow that one, Rob. How, uh, how does it inform your coaching? And do you think, two-part question, do you think you attract athletes? I'm thinking particularly Chrissy Wellington and Craig Alexander from what small amount, admittedly, I know about them. 
do you feel you attracted athletes who shared similar traits in terms of drive to you and how do you think you could help them those two that you just cited absolutely Mm. Uh, and and people have asked me uh, like i have the crystal ball i don't like the question and i'll come back to craig and chrissy you know who's going to win hawaii this year and i I think it's a discredit for any any person you know including myself to say to to rule out someone else and to bring someone else on the pedestal I, i don't like doing that but i have seen this conviction and this just relentless behavior to be the best with chrissy and craig and i saw that very very early on I saw with Aaron Baker way back dur- during her time, and, and and certainly, you know, with Mark Allen, Scott Molina, and Scott Tinley, the, the same type of passion I saw with Julie Dibbins a, 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 as well, and uh, you know, there's a whole list. Tim Don, like you know, um, Simon Lessing. There's a whole slew of them that seem to have the right chemical makeup to say. Nah, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. And I'm going to figure out how to do it. I'm going to use my brain to do it. Both the first two, Chrissy and Craig, extremely bright, very, very bright, very analytical, sometimes too much. But, uh, you know, they they both were, they had a passion that said, I, I, I can get better. And, and when, I, when I first got them, Rob, they were already good. And I just said, okay, I've got to, I've got to find out where their weaknesses are and see if we can isolate those, build their strengths up, but really go after their weaknesses. I, I, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was to, you know, muck up their <laughs> their current level. And ironically, both of them were, were very, very weak and asymmetrical. And so, you know, we went to the gym. And I'm, I'm pretty pathological about having sy- symmetry and balance and and good strength and on and on and on. And, and both their left sides were, were just out of whack. Like I remember they, you know, they just went ballistic. I said, tighten that glute muscle. And they were kind of the same. And I remember the left side was, it was just like a bowl of butter. And I said, well, that's not very tight. That's not like a piece of granite. I said, tighten that thing. And I said, I am. And I said, well, it's, it's not firing. So they could see it, see it right away. And, and that just drove them mad. Like, wow, Dave's right on this. I've got to get that gluteal muscle strong again. You know, it's one simple example, but <laughs> there was a very kind of a funny story. I, I tried to, you know, I was had hands on. Of course, when Chrissy got in a wreck, that was that was amazing. A week plus into that race, it was actually 14 days uh, leading, leading up to her last victory. But I saw Craig over on his last win and, and I kind of leave him alone and I happened to see him. I was leaving the pool. I swam and he was in a van with his family and friends. And, 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 and I could tell he, as soon as he rolled down the window, he spotted me right away. He was kind of naturally nervous. And, and the first thing he said, which was so, so ironic on a topic we're discussing. Yeah, 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 yeah. My, 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 my glutes are firing, Dave, but the, you know, they're, they're feeling good. <laughs> I said, well, the, then you're going to have a great day. It was such an idiotic comment by him and very funny. And it was just one of those things, you know, sort of coming back to your question that I love coaching them because they, they were going to, they were going to turn the, the right, uh, right seed to say, Hey, I can be better. They, they never got to the point where they said, Oh, I figured this out. I'm amazing. I'm incredible. I've won this race. And it was always, I'm not good enough. And I'll I'll just share something with Chrissy, which I have shared with many people. I didn't go over the road when she broke her world record. Um, She, uh, she went eight, 19 and she went eight, eight, 18. And I was on the phone with her before and and kind of went through the game plan. And, you know, we both knew it it was really just her race. And I'm not degrading the other women, but she was so far ahead of the other women in that field that day I, I said, you know, you, you're going to have the men around. You're going to be working with those men, but it's really about yourself. So one of the things that we did work on coming back to her strengths was the back half of her run. Her marathon was terrible. She, she quite often would go 120, 
121, 122 going out, and she'd come back in 28 to 30 on the second half. And I said, well, that's shocking. The fall off is amazing. Time looks pretty good, but you really fell off. So a number of things without getting into those. So she comes across the finish line. I'm listening online to the race, and she she uh, she breaks the um, – breaks a world record and, and there's just pandemonium there. It's, you know, I can hear this in the background and, and she's just beside herself. And, and she's, you know, I said, when you can call me, call me because I'll be listening. And of course I was overjoyed. One of the first things she said, the first thing she said was, yeah, I, 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 I just didn't ride as well as I could have or something, or I wasn't as strong as I could have been on the bike. And I, and I know because on her splits and comparatively to the men that day, which was, it was really a beautiful day, uh, weather wise and condition wise and the climate the athletically and competitively is amazing. Uh, and I said, ah, you know, she probably could have gone two or three minutes faster on her bike, but she ran like a demon. And I, and I said to her, Chrissy, 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 I said, you just broke your world record. Could you savor that for a moment? So it kind of comes back to, you know, she, she was very humble, but very hard on herself. And ultimately that was part of, uh, you know, sort of the time in her career where she said, I've had enough because she, uh, and above and beyond Craig, and I, and I would say similar in a lot of ways to myself, she put so much internal pressure on herself and I, you know, felt it, sensed it. We hit like two brick engines many, many times. And I wanted to stop coaching her. I just said, you know, you're, you're just too rough. And it's not that, you know, I'm not a course guy myself, but it was just, I, I just felt like, you know, maybe we'd gone far enough and you find someone else, but it was really, I just felt she was never could allow her this restful period. And I, you know, I remember inviting her over. I'm, I'm well done my off from my competitive days and, and her, her fiance at the time, or even before that, Tom was there. And I said, well, how about a glass of wine? Be good for you. <laughs> and no, 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 no. I'm, you know, the race is eight weeks away. I said, well, so what? I have two glasses, you know? So she, she was so... She was so crazy driven, but at the same time, it, it, it emotionally beat her up a lot. Yeah. I can see my, I can see a reflection of myself on that. So I, I think that was, you know, I guess it was a long story, but you know, one of the reasons I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with her and ironically I sent her, she sent me a note picture of Esme, her cute little daughter. And I sent her a note back today and uh, you know, I, I have the utmost admiration for both those athletes that I mentioned, Craig and Chrissy, and, and, you know, part of it is just this huge respect for their character, uh, a humbleness that they have, but inside they're just like deranged pit bulls in a pen, you know, (laughs) they could turn that nastiness on and that ability to race well and just dig down to the deepest level, which, you know, I love to see. Do you think that working with guys like them, and I think it's been my last question, do you think the fact that it re- they remind you of you, has that been part of your own sort of healing almost, like like your therapeutic journey, working with people who remind you of you when you were 20 years younger? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so. Very, very, you're very insightful, Rob. I think that a- absolutely is one of the keys. You know, you get... Uh, you know, well beyond the time where I should have recognized this, but I think the recognition also came about with the help of these athletes. And uh, I mentioned Julie Divens, who I, I thought could be multiple, multiple world champions, uh, champion. And, and she was incredibly gifted and um, ha- had a, a couple of really bad injuries and a, ultimately a bad surgery. And I s- saw her and felt her angst, that she, uh, when you can control it, eventually control it, you can bring out that top performance. And she was debilitated by, you know, a couple of injuries and the surgery that really didn't allow her to, to reach her highest level. But I saw this well before um, her, her, her injury. Uh, and I just said, you know, Julie, you're, you're just too darn hard on yourself because 
if I can do this workout, but I can do a little bit more, I'll be better. Well, that was exactly like Dave Scott. Exactly. Well, I'll do this. Oh, I, you know, I know you only told me to run an hour 45, but I ran 215. And, I, and you know, the last part was pretty easy. And, the, and, and, you know, she's trying to mollify, but also at the same time, elevate herself and her, her self-worth. And, and I, I can see this in all the athletes. So I, I think it, you know, in, in some ways, selfishly, it was therapeutic for me to, to work yeah. with these, these people that had the, the, the same gene. Well, I think that's a really great place to leave it, Dave. It's been, it's been fascinating to talk to you. I've, I've loved having you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. You've been very generous, and um, I hope we can, we can catch up again sometime in the future. Well, I hope, hope to get over there, uh, Rob. You know, I've, I have some connections uh, in the UK and love to join your team. I'm kind of in the slow swim lane now, and I can barely – barely move when I'm running. I can still ride. Okay. I've had a couple of heart issues, so that's kind of slowed me down a little bit. So, uh, but I'm still kind of nuts about exercise. I did get out for a ride this morning and uh, that was a treat. And I'm going to see if I can get in a little swim here later in the day, but pleasure chatting with you and, and all the best to your team. I know you've got all the accolades as the, the, the super coach and your program is uh, justifiably at the top of the tier. Oh, thank you very much. That's a really kind thing to say. Thank you. Oh, you made my day. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I'll speak to you again soon. Will do. Wow. So, uh, so that just happened then. <laughs> it's not every day you get complimented on your coaching by Dave Scott, is it? Um, I'd, I'd love that interview with Dave. I think he's an absolutely fascinating character and, I think as more time goes by, the more he shares of his story, what the reality of his life was like, you know, the time has built him up to be a myth. And, and I've just listened back to the start of that. And I kind of make a bit of a joke and say, you know, the man, the myth, the legend. But really, I think that's part of what this is. People become myths. I've heard Mark Allen talk about how he, you know, the stories of Dave Scott would get into his head, this idea of him rinsing his cottage cheese and going the extra mile to try and, you know, I'll do anything it takes to win. Um, and then when you actually hear what he's been through in his life and you hear how compelled he was to exercise and how driven and the depression that he suffered from, you realize that very often we're comparing our comparing our insides with other people's outsides and we don't really know what's going on with other people behind the scenes so we had a little chat afterwards and I said to David I think it's incredibly valuable when someone who's held up as a figure like him of being you know strength and power and the the guy who was unbeatable I mean his nickname is the man isn't it when he actually it faces with honesty what the reality of the situation was and says, look, it wasn't like this for me. There were times I couldn't get off the sofa and train. I've been exactly like Dave in the past. I've had some horrible periods with depression. I've had horrible days when I've not been able to get off the couch. I know a lot of the athletes that I coach have had it as well. And in sharing our stories with each other, I think we tend to think we are the only person going through this. The more of us who share our stories and say, look, I've, I've been through this, I've struggled with it. And you know what? Firstly, you're not alone. And secondly, it will get better. It's, it's more, it's, it's better for everybody, isn't it? And when a guy like Dave Scott can admit his, his vulnerabilities and when he can be humble like that, I think it does such a great service for the world in general, let alone, you know, the triathlon world. Um, so yeah, so brilliant. So I'm going to send Dave a team oxygen addict hat and we're going to have him in our team from now on. I've decided he's going to be a member. He's having a free lifetime membership. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, just before we wrap this up, there's some, there's a really great tweet. I think some of you've seen it. I retweeted it this weekend. If anyone knows this guy, Spanish triathlete, Diego Mentriga, um, he notices he's in, there's a thing going around on Twitter. He's running for the line. He gets in a sprint finish with a British triathlete called James Teagle. And James Teagle has been the wrong way. He corrects himself. He comes the right way. He sprints past Diego Mentriga. He crashes into the barriers. And Mentriga slows down and lets him pass right on the line. So he gets a third place and says afterwards, look, this guy had beaten me. He made the mistake and went the wrong way at the finish. But it was his rightful place for third place. Some of the comments on Twitter are from people saying, you know, this guy's weak racing's all about making the best decisions and he shouldn't let him win if he hadn't earned it 
I think that's absolutely nonsense. And everyone's entitled to their opinion, but that opinion's nonsense, right? <laughs> Diego Mentrigo, you are my hero, right? You have brightened up my life. If anyone knows him, I would love to send this guy a baseball cap to say well done because it's a great example of good sportsmanship and I think it's fantastic. So if you haven't seen it, I've retweeted it on Twitter. The OA podcast Twitter feed has retweeted it. Just check it out and it'll put a bit of a smile on your face. And I think that's a fitting way to end this episode. All right then, so some discount codes and deals for you to finish. Precision Hydration, use the code OxygenAddict15. For 15% off your first electrolyte order. And remember, you can book a free 20-minute hydration call with one of their hydration experts. So links in the show notes for that. Thriver.co. Use the code OxygenAddict10 for 10% off all home blood tests. TeamOxygenAddict.com. The most comprehensive triathlon coaching program for busy age groupers. And I can now say endorsed by Dave Scott. You can beat up by, uh, we can beat the price increase by getting into the team before the end of September when our prices are going up by £200. So get in before the 1st of October. And remember... There's links in the show notes for all of these sponsors so you don't have to remember them. And until next week, have a great, safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby, and you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. Have a great week, everyone. See ya. See ya.